see the screen. Perfect. Yes, good. So here we go. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Uh, uh, Leslie Roshi and I have been planning this for a long time, and hopefully you're going to find something in this webinar that really is not only appeals to you, but also is useful for your lessons. Um, first thing I have to say is most of us, in all likelihood, must be in lockdown. Um, I just want to tell you that I know that this is hard. We are all going through the motions. We are working more than if we were working in our schools. Uh, but these two shall pass. and We will come out stronger as a community because of this. What I want to talk about today is assessment for learning in competency-based ESL, particularly looking at the way in which we uh, can profit from the application of assessment for learning uh, in those cases where we are uh, educating people in a second language to be able to perform well in the world of work. And I know that competency-based instruction in general in the broader field of education has taken a lot of slack. Uh, it has come under a lot of <clears throat> pardon me, in, in, under a lot of criticism for being too mechanistic or for being too uh, results-oriented and behaviorist in, in its approach to teaching. However, uh, one has to say that the way uh, most language curricula are organized around the world, particularly those that are tied either to the uh, Common European Framework for Reference or other guidelines such as ACTFLs, uh, they are all competency-based. And what we see when we look at the approaches used for teaching those people with these tools, with these frameworks, is not competency-based instruction. And one of the strong um, areas of competency-based instruction is the constant need to resort to assessment in order to inform teaching and learning. So the plan for today is basically this. I would like to talk about being competent in a new language. Uh, I'm going to look at old and new views. We're going to look at what a competency is. Uh, then, sorry, the role of assessment in competency-based instruction, then assessment for learning in competency-based instruction, and assessment for learning ideas and tools. I'm going to try and share some things I've applied in my lessons that have resulted in positive information, both for students and myself. And then I will leave you with a coda that, is, uh, that addresses specifically the need for formative feedback to be given uh, to students. So we will look at being competent in a new language. Um, we, we can all relate to the 1981 Canadian Swain framework uh, that described communicative competence as a blend of four sub-competencies or uh, um, supporting competences that have to do with linguistic competence, that is knowing your grammar, knowing your uh, syntax, your uh, vocabulary, the lexicon, etc. Social linguistic competence, being able to use those, that linguistic uh, information in appropriate social settings. And in order to do that, you need to string the syntax and the semantics into discourse units. And if you have a breakdown in any of those three competences, you have a strategic competence that helps you, gives you the tools to uh, make up for uh, the lack of information in the others. Now, the implications of this view, which has permeated the field of language teaching for more than half a century, well, over half a century, is that first of all, that we look at language as a system of systems, uh, not as something organic and socially embedded 
and emerging from interaction. The second implication is that we look at language as an innate human capacity. And in that sense, we cannot find a real seat for uh, language uh, itself. I would like to propose that we look at a second uh, application or conceptualization of linguistic competence, of oh, sorry, of communicative competence. And that's the work of Bachman and Palmer, which I find for the purposes of uh, competency-based instruction is a much better fit as a description of competence. They talk about two main competences, basically, organizational and pragmatic. So you organize your uh, speaking intention, what the message you want to give, and then you have the pragmatic components. In the, at the level of organizational competence, we have two kinds of competences, the grammatical competence, and the textual competence. And this comes from a view of, of language that looks at it as social semiotic, embedded in social practices and stemming from them in the form of texts. And the text is any um, discourse that holds together cohesively through meaning. Okay, it could be written or oral. It could be as short as a stop sign, that's a text or it could be a whole long novel like Don Quixote or whatever, right? And then at the pragmatic level, we have this elocutionary competence that has to do with ideational functions, manipulative functions, and heuristic functions, and social linguistic competence. Now you may be wondering, well, but what if there's a breakdown in, in these competence where strategic competence? Bachmann and Palmer do not consider it as part of linguistic of communicative competence, but as a, a personal ability. We have learning strategies we put, for, uh, we put forward to uh, solving uh, these problems that appear in communication. So starting from this perspective that we look at two kinds of competence, organizational and pragmatic, let's make the case for why this is a better fit. Well, basically, it looks as language as a, as a resource for making meaning. Secondly, language is socially constructed and as a tool that allows interaction. That language is socially situated, and this has a high relevance for workplace ESL, because many times what we are teaching is not general English, it's the English that people will need in order to be able to perform well in a certain function in a job. That means both at the comprehension level and at the expression level, right? And language is a mental tool because in this view, we are very Vygotskian in the position that language develops thought and thinking develops language. And of course, it looks at language as dynamic. So how do we put this to use in a competency-based framework? How do we unpack it? First of all, if we look at the origin of the word competency, it comes from both the Greek and the Latin. At the Greek level, there were two terms, agon and agonistes, and competence means the person who won the competition. That woman who's competent is somebody who succeeded. Now, with Latin, the meaning became a little bit softened um, through the word competere, and is what one must achieve in a responsible manner. And that is more, more in line with what we consider to be a good definition of a competency. Sergio Tobon is a, an expert in competency-based instruction, and he defines it as a complex process of performance oriented towards accepted criteria and respecting a particular ethical guideline, a particular ethical guidelines. That means, that is to say, that a competency is not a behavior, a competency is not a one-off thing, it's a complex process and it's performance oriented. And that performance cannot be any performance. It has to be a performance according to a set of accepted criteria, and it has to respect particular ethical guidelines. 
what competencies do is they help us articulate knowledge through an ongoing process of developing metacognition. And what do we mean by that? When we are engaged in competency-based instruction, what we are trying to do is to help students see themselves as learners. So we, we help plan, we help them monitor their performance, and we help them self-evaluate their performance. This is an example of a competency taken from ACTFL's guidelines. This is a description of what a novice uh, mid-level, sub-level would be. And here you see that the description of the competency says that they are able to communicate minimally. And in the same color we have, they may say only two or three words at a time or give an occasional stock answer. What is in that color, uh, this light orange, right? has to do with what students can do and that is basically a skill now that skill is supported by some concepts some information and that is what appears in um, the kind of mauve color so they communicate minimally how using a number of isolated words and memorized phrases but we don't stop there there's the bright yellow face uh, where they describe the attitude. So a competency is a complex performance because it incorporates concepts, skills, and attitudes. What are the implications of this for education? I remember at the beginning I told you that uh, competences are quite controversial and from a critical perspective, uh, they are seen as too mechanistic and too results-oriented. These are my uh, thoughts about the implications of a uh, complex approach to competency-based instruction. First of all, competences are not final products. They are ongoing processes of performance. And that performance starts being uh, not adequate and progresses through a series of improvements until it becomes the specified performance. Now, this process of developing competency is bound by both a set of pre-specified criteria, that is to say, in the case of workplace ESL, we are looking at what is acceptable language, what are acceptable texts in that environment. I just think for a minute, say for example, a lab technician, the language that the lab technician needs to um, uh, develop, and look at another workplace environment such as a uh, construction worker. The texts are going to be different. The language is going to look different because the social setting is what gives, um, uh, gives sense to the, to the task of creating the language. Now, a competency is evidence through performance. So that means students need to be doing things with the language. It's not a process of passive reception. So they are acting in the world using those resources that we feed into the competency, the, not, the concepts, the skills, and the attitudes. Because of all these things, competency-based instruction dwells mostly on meaning-making processes that allow people to perform in real life settings. So what we do in the classroom is preparation for real life and we borrow from real life in order to inform our teaching. Because of that, performance is not practice. You can teach a person how to do something, but if you don't combine the concept, the skills and the attitudes to the context in which they are going to be enacted, it will make no sense. So what is the role of assessment in competency-based instruction? Let me start by showing you this Peanuts um, cartoon, and I'm going to try and leave it for you to read on screen for a minute. Now, if you look at the source of this cartoon, uh, which appears below it, 
It's a penis cartoon that appeared on 26 March 1972. And if I look at the situation in many classrooms around the world nowadays, uh, not much has changed. What this girl is experiencing in her piece of art assessment is not like what many learners receive uh, as feedback on their performance in a language class. It's a grade, a number or a letter right, or a well done, or a, you need to improve, and not much beyond that. So what is the role of assessment in competency-based instruction? Actually, it's a very crucial role. In competency-based instruction, there is a process for implementing assessment. There's diagnostic assessment, there is assessment for learning, and there is assessment of learning. The diagnostic assessment will inform you of the baseline that students bring with them. That is to say what they already know and that you might need to improve or you might need to make use of during the teaching phase. Throughout the process, assessment for learning is implemented to provide teachers and students with a uh, point of need information about how the students are learning and that allows the learner to take proactive actions uh, in order to improve their performance and it allows the teacher to make changes to instructional approach so cater for the needs of the students and because it's ongoing and permanent we say it's process oriented. And in terms of assessment for learning, that is what comes basically at the end where we, we do accreditation, where we see whether the, for the competence has been um, a, 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 a appropriated by this, uh, it's, uh, the, it, the students performing at the level we expect them to perform. So think of these three as a continuum throughout the course in, with assessment for learning being embedded in teaching. <clears throat> as I said, assessment in competency-based learning is process-oriented. It's embedded in the learning activities. It yields information about learning and teaching at the point of need. And here, the beauty is that it allows the teacher multiple scaffolding moves to ascertain that students are progressing towards the desired performances. But not only to the teacher, because assessment for learning incorporates things as assessment by peers and assessment by oneself, together with uh, what the teacher assesses. So that also allows the student to develop uh, an inkling into how they are doing or how they are performing. performing. Remember we said uh, a competency uh, has predetermined criteria. So those are what we call the criterion reference kind of evaluation. And by having a client or a continuum of uh, levels of performance, we can very well help students locate themselves within a particular level, and we can give them tools to improve to be able to move on to the next level. So that the, one of the beauties of, of uh, assessment for learning is that it allows for differentiation to take place. Now, the trick here is it has to be ongoing and it has to be systematic. You cannot just do assessment for learning on Mondays and then take them up next month. This is an ongoing, purposefully integrated into teaching behavior. It, because of that, it also needs recording because it's like plotting the course of, uh, of a vessel, right? You know where you are leaving from, you know where you want to go, but you need to know where you are at each stage of the process. So it needs the teacher and the students to keep a record of how they are doing. Remember, it's done by teachers and students, and it is based on public criteria. And the key here is it has to be known ahead of time by students. 
So many times when I do assessment workshops, I ask this question, uh, when do you share the assessment criteria with students? Well, a traditional approach to assessment, which uh, permeates many educational systems around the world, says that we share the criteria after we give the students a grade and we tell them, well, you've got a B, a C, an A, whatever, because, and then this is at the end of the process, what can the student do at that stage? Not much. However, if we bring in the criteria from the get-go and even involve learners in developing criteria of what a good performance entails, then there's ownership for the learning. So let's look at assessment for learning, specifically in competency-based instruction. I see this, the role of assessment for learning uh, as both support and challenge. On the one hand, it gives me information about where my students are. It gives my students information about where they are. But at the same time, it challenges everybody, myself and my students, to move on to the next level. So it has a future orientation, which is good. It is goal-oriented. We are not just learning English because we're learning English for a particular purpose in order to be able to apply it in our workplace, in order to be able to apply it academically, etc. It is, it provides us with learning focused information. It's not just information about um, test results. It actually gives us information about how the students are learning and how we are teaching. That is why it's also instruction focus information that we receive because we might know that if most of our students are you know getting it right that means we are not teaching it right because of this that information that assessment for learning gives us becomes a planning tool for the teacher it gives us the teacher a chance to actually rethink what we are doing in the classroom and make changes at the point of need. We don't have to wait until the very end to be able to uh, correct the way we, we're teaching. So in a sense, it allows us to engage in dialogues about learning and teaching with our students, and it's responsive to the needs of the students. That's why I say it's a form of dialogic teaching, right? where both teacher and learner take place uh, take uh, have an encounter where each of them is learning from the other and about themselves at the same time. This information that we receive through assessment for learning is the basis for productive, constructive feedback that allows the students to do better. And as I said before, because I know and the students know where each of them are and we have publicly known criteria communicated ahead of time to the students and used daily as a reflection tool, because of that, we can differentiate our instruction. So, what ideas and what tools can I offer for you? We're going to go through um, some tried and tested uh, ideas that you may be using already. But what I like to do is try to uh, use them with a twist. And this is what I'm going to be sharing with you. <clears throat> As I said, there's a process. How do we plan this assessment for learning process? And how do we embed it in instruction? First of all, we start with your learning goals. What are students supposed to learn? You get that through the competency descriptors that you receive uh, as part of your curriculum or that you create as part of your curriculum development process. Once you have those clear, once you know what concepts, skills, and attitudes are involved in those uh, learning goals, <clears throat> Because this is competency-based instruction, what you have to do is decide on what I call a culminating authentic performance task. See, 
your see your students in the future as after this module after this course after this unit and see what they should be able to do that gives uh, testimony to them having achieved the competency that you're trying to to teach them once you have that clear and that includes thinking for example what uh an average student to, in your class might be able to do, but also think about what uh, an above average student in your class would be able to do as a consequence of your teaching, or somebody who's not an average student in your class, somebody who generally underperforms, would be able to do, and making decisions in terms of that. And what you're going to look for as a consequence of having designed that culminating performance task, which is, students doing something with what you're teaching them. You have to develop specific success criteria for the task. And once you have seen in your mind's eye what uh, an average student, a below average or above average student are able to do, you have there your set of public criteria. Now look at the competencies and unpack them. What concepts, what uh, skills and what attitudes are needed for the students in order to perform at, uh, at competency level. And the last thing you will do is plan your instruction, embedding assessment in the tasks that you give students. If you look at this, it well, framework for curriculum development called backward design because we start with the end in mind but in the world of competency-based learning our role as teachers is to take students to good sufficient performance in a particular role. So it's not just about covering units in a course book, and it's not just about teaching pre-specified content only. It's making sure that your students are able to do what they came to your classroom to learn. So we start with rubrics. We all use rubrics. You know what a rubric entails. You have on the left-hand column, a uh, breakdown of the criteria that basically breaks down what's needed in order to do to achieve a task and then you have different performance uh, levels with performance descriptors rubrics are great there are some standard rubrics for example for writing um, you may have heard about the six plus one traits of writing this is research oriented uh, material the, tools have been developed to cover a wide range of writing tasks and contexts. But <clears throat> my ideas are to engage the students in building the rubric. How do you do that? Well, if you have samples of students' work from previous courses, or you can find some videos on the, on the internet of people doing the tasks that you want your students to do, you help them analyze what is entailed in that performance. So then you inform them about what you are going to teach them in order to um, uh, help them focus on what they will need to do. This is an important part of uh, the development of metacognition because you are giving them tools for planning their performance in the future, right? And once you have the, the rubric, make it public share it with the students have the students keep a copy of it send them to them uh, on their devices upload it to your learning management system create a poster and display it on the, in the on the classroom walls make it public and refer to it as students are going through different activities in the classroom i always say share your rubrics with colleagues for validation uh, when you do rubrics uh, on your own it's very easy to fall prey to the blind spot uh, syndrome by which you're so uh, into the activity itself and your plan and everything that you fail to see other dimensions. So when you share the rubric with a colleague, the colleague can implement it in their classroom 
I gives you information. And then whenever you do something connected to the rubric in your teaching, have the students take out the rubric and use it for planning, monitoring, and self-assessing, right? And then make sure that when you grade students, you use exactly that same rubric, right? You may be uh, thinking, but who would do something like that? It has happened. Um, rubrics can be very easily turned into what we call a checklist. The checklist is basically a yes, no, um, ticking boxes, list of criteria that you may want to, to have students use uh, for self-assessment and for peer assessment, but also for planning, right? <clears throat> Again, based on the scriptures on what you want students to achieve, make it realistic, thinking always about what, what the students uh, are able to do or should be able to do at that stage of the learning process and always bearing in mind what the intended performance looks like. If you give students any kind of instrument for self and peer assessment and that you are later on going to use for assessing their performance, go through the instrument with the students, clarify questions, explain things to them, help them make sense of what you are doing from your teaching. And leave your feedback for the end, have the students self-assess and peer assess before you give them your final. Um... Okay, I'm sorry, I, I just keep opening pop-up windows. Do you use a class agenda? Many people criticize the use of class agendas. They see it, particularly with adults, they see it as childish. <clears throat> and not really effective. I use a class agenda in every single lesson, even teacher education classes and professional development sessions, because I feel that having a pathway to follow uh, is a useful metacognitive tool as well. An agenda for me would look like uh, something like what you see on the illustration. Uh, we are going to talk in a few minutes about learning goals and success criteria as an integral part of teaching as well, teaching assessment. Uh, <clears throat> I would start with the dates. I would um, specify the learning goals for the session and also show the students success criteria for what we are going to do. Then I'm going to list the activities, but I'm not just going to put that information and leave it sitting there. I'm going to explain to them why that learning goal that I'm proposing for a particular class is uh, worthy, how that learning goal contributes to the, their success as learners and their success as users of the language in the context where they're going to be using it. I'm going to show them what a successful user of that knowledge conveyed through the learning goal is able to do. And maybe the person is not able to do the whole performance, but the person is able to do at least part of the performance. And that is what is expected of them. And I will show them how each of the activities that we, uh, that we list on the agenda contribute to the ultimate goal of the session. Um, I will put the takeaways from the lesson as a, a bit of the agenda. This is always standard takeaways from the lesson. Is all lessons should have a closure. The lessons should have a moment where students will reflect on what they've done and take in stock. Uh, Leslie Painter and I wrote a book a few years ago called Lessons Learned. And in our classroom management uh, chapter, we made a point of, uh, always having a moment for students to reflect because particularly if you have young adults, um, you ask them, what did we do in class today? And they don't know. It's another important uh, part of metacognition to look back and say, okay, this is what we've done. I'm going to show you a few ways where that information can be brought to bear. And then if you have any homework, and I strongly recommend that you do give your students manageable homework 
something that they need to do to come prepare for the next session, but that does not require them sitting down for two hours filling in blanks, right? Something useful as preparation for the following class. Now, how do we use the agenda? Of course, we start the class, we put the agenda up on the board, or maybe we have a display uh, bulletin board where we put the agenda, right? <clears throat> It is just, it's not just a class management tool, which is what the agendas are at uh, the level of elementary education. Here you need to be systematic as well. You need to include the agenda every day and have this discussion of the agenda with students. It shouldn't last more than two minutes and it needn't last more than two minutes, right? Or three, but it's very, um, is an empowering tool for students to be able to know what they're going to be doing, why they are doing it, how that contributes to the, uh, their uh, ultimate goals. You can engage the students in helping you create the agenda as you progress through the course. Uh, ask students, okay, what would you like to do? Or maybe even uh, transfer the responsibility over the agenda to the students. Uh, in terms of them preparing things for the peers. <clears throat> a few of my colleagues who use this even have their students copy the agenda, right? So that they have a record class to class of what was done, right? And because they are going to be taking notes while you are explaining the agenda, it's also a tool for them to keep track of the learning that has taken place, right? Many times the student's notebook is the only resource they have outside the course book uh, to review uh, for learning. And then at the end of the class, at the moment of takeaways from the lesson, stop the class and go back to the agenda and generate assessment from the agenda, like at what, which point of the class did we talk about X? Can anybody remember um, a sentence from the text that we read? Uh, does anybody remember a question that we worked with, et cetera? And that helps create the idea of, okay, this is all that we've achieved today, right? And then go back to the learning goal and just check we said we were going to do this, and are you now able to do this? And I'm going to show you a few ways to do that as well. <clears throat> I said we we're going to talk about uh, learning goals and success criteria. I call this being clear and going public, right? It's not enough for students to know that today they're going to be uh, learning about a certain grammatical structure or vocabulary set. They need to know what that helps them do in real life. The example you have there, and oops, I see you cannot see the source, but this has been taken from Pinterest, right? <clears throat> Is an example of a learning goal in an English language arts class. Uh, they, the students are dealing with the topic characteristics of a character. So the learning goal is to identify characteristics of a character and give evidence, examples, from the text to support each characteristic. Students know that that will help them. If they are able to do that, then they will be able to relate to the characters and provide a more personal response to the, uh, to the reading they're doing. But then if we specify the success criteria, students, that brings down the learning goal to a manageable position for the student. So here they have to name three important characteristics, give evidence, and use correct spelling, punctuation, and grammar. Laying out the success criteria allows the students to know what they need to be doing, right? And this is a way in which we are embedding assessment for learning in the, in, in, the, in our teaching. The students are going to be using this success criteria to self-monitor throughout the class. <clears throat> this comes from Gemma Harvey in the UK. Uh, she has a blog spot full of ideas and she has this wonderful give me five which she uses with elementary students and I have somehow adapted 
to adult audiences, right? Uh, it's basically one for each finger. You look at the thumb, thumbs up, name one thing you learned in today's lesson. Uh, Peter Pointer, for the pointer finger, uh, how are you to use this in the future? Toby Toll, what can you do now that you couldn't before the lesson? Ring finger, if you could ring a classmate, what question would you ask them about the lesson? And this is good information for the teacher about things that students haven't gotten during our teaching, right? And then the pinky promise, what will you do to use what you learn in class in real life? That is the extension. You can use, I, I like the idea of the five and the next of the fingers, and um, you can de devise what place in which to address each of the fingers in the give me five. You're all familiar with the KW chart, I assume. What do we know about a certain topic? What do we want to learn? And then at the end of the lesson, what have we learned? Students do this individually or preferably in pairs or groups, right? But what if you added a second layer to this? Because remember what we said so far, assessment for learning is embedded in teaching and it's a way of fostering the development of metacognition in these students. So for the first column, we do, what do we know about the topic? And then how, do, how did we learn this? It's important for students to take stock of, oh, we learned this because such and such a colleague in the group shared it with us, or I remember at school learning about this, or when I was in the factory or in the office or in my work, I remember seeing this or listening to this or hearing that. So that makes students aware where learning opportunities lie. Then to what do we want to learn about? You can ask the students the question, how do you want to learn it? Why? Because that gives you information about what works and what doesn't work for students in terms of uh, the procedural aspects of learning, right? We may do a diagnostic questionnaire at the beginning of the year, and it's assessment. But then that information is generally lost to us. It's good to bring it up every now and then when we use these um, uh, KWL charts, um, bringing that to bear so as to keep our uh, teaching more aligned to the students. And then at the end of the teaching sequence, we always ask the question, what have we learned about? And students fill out the third column. Now, what if you added a challenge there, like challenge questions for other groups? So what did you learn about this? They think in groups, they write it down, but then at the same time, they have to create questions. And you spend the, the last five minutes of the, of the class having groups bounce questions off one another. Another way of using the KWO chart. Uh, graphic representations of learning are important uh, and uh, using the bullseye uh, metaphor as an assessment tool can be a productive tool both for self-assessment, peer assessment and group assessment. Many times we have students working in groups and we don't look at um, we don't really give them a, a chance to assess how they worked in groups. A bullseye can be used in two ways. Uh, again, everything comes down to the criteria. You can have the bullseye answers, example that you see there, <clears throat> where you have different colors and students have to say what color uh, the questions were, for example. If they were black ring answers, the answers were far from correct. If they were yellow, uh, the answers fully address the question asked and can be supported with evidence from the text. <clears throat> Another way of using this is uh, like the second one. This is actually from uh, um, a Spanish uh, training of uh, supervisors and educational managers. And there you have the different criteria in each sector of the concentric circles, and each participant will color the level, their own level of attainment according to what they have gotten there. There's basically uh, 
personal abilities and the students there are self-assessing their uh, working in groups, empathy, concern about other people, assertiveness, active listening, and clarity and succinctness in communication and expression. <clears throat> you all know about exit tickets. Uh, exit tickets can be fun. Uh, there are lots of templates online to that look like actual tickets, right? But the activity of having the students stop, think, provide you with information about the learning in writing that you can take home and reflect on is great. I purposefully selected this uh, ex ticket from a teacher. Um, it appeared in on Facebook and it was one of those chains that you get. But the teacher said this ex exit ticket really made my day and to me that would be my dream exit ticket right <clears throat> but have students focus on the metacognitive processes that they have gone through so what was easy for you what was difficult for you did you plan what you do what you did uh, did the planning work etc and vary the prompts from week to week <laughs> I have never done it but I've heard of people doing it where the the students one the teacher has gotten the ball rolling every week with exit tickets and the variation of an exit ticket is a one minute paper and this is basically sit down and write for a minute according to a prompt that your teacher gives you it can be done with or without writing prompt some teachers choose to do like free write write about your learning this week like this or teachers tell me about the vocabulary you learned this week. You know, how you always you can always give them a prompt, right? Students can create their own prompts, and sometimes it's good to give students choices, right? If you do this on a regular basis, again once a week, every fifteen days, it depends on how often you see your students. If you see them every day, maybe I would say twice a week, right? But then when you take the information home and look at it, look for the patterns and the answers uh, to the students and address those that the majority had issue with first. Because whenever we do these things, students expect us to come back and do something about the information that they are giving us, right? <clears throat> and then I would like to share with you these learning focus questions. There is an organization in the United Kingdom called Looking for Learning, and they provide curriculum services, assessment services, and even um, uh, actually provide an international curriculum for international schools. And one of the things that they have is this looking for learning questions, which are a very well-kept secret. Only people who belong to, to the organization know them. But the spirit is basically, to create a series of questions that you systematically pose to the students uh, about their learning, right? To find out how they are doing and what they would need. In the case of, for example, classroom evaluations uh, in my workplace, whenever we do a classroom evaluation, we are evaluating the teacher, of course, or we do a mentoring visit. We are supporting a colleague, but at the end of the lesson, we have um, a Google form uh, with the six questions that you can see on the screen. And we give them the students a QR code and they answer the questions on their cell phones uh, before leaving the classroom. Uh, we try doing it with students. Okay, take this QR code and take a photograph and then you do it at home and they never did. So we insist that we do it now. Why? Because it's a crucial set of information that the teacher who has been mentored or supervised can resort to, to think back about their teaching, what went well, what didn't go so well, and also what they could do, could have done differently, right? And you have information from the students, you have self uh, assessment from the teacher, and you have the supervisor or mentor's uh, observation. Well, with the students, we can use the same learning focus questions. 
uh, as a way of uh, promoting this uh, more inclusive look at things. So, my coda, and I'm looking at it, and yes, we're going to have uh, about five minutes for questions. What is the role of feedback in assessment for learning? I would like to just point out that uh, there's a lot of research on constructive, constructive formative feedback and language learning. There are amazing uh, research projects and amazing information. But basically, when we look at feedback, we're looking at three questions. Where am I going? How am I going there? And where to next? And this could be coded as feed up, where am I going? So that is the planning part of the metacognitive process. How am I going is feedback. And then what to next with what ha I have learned today, what can I do in the future? That would be feed four, right? Or feed forward, right? If you're familiar with the work of Hattie and Tem Temperley on making learning visible, they have identified uh, feedback, pro productive, formative feedback as one of the most impactful teacher actions that affect learning, right? It sits there together with uh, uh, reciprocal teaching as one of the most effective strategies uh, that prom teaching strategies that promotes good learning. And this quote that you are reading, right, uh, sort of explains that. What are the conditions uh, of feedback to be effective? <clears throat> Makbub and Yilmaz came up with a wonderful way of looking at how to give feedback uh, online that is uh, represented in these four quadrants. They say that feedback, good feedback, uh, is a combination of a good rationale and being explicit about uh, what students have done, right? So um, they say, for example, if your rationale is uh, very, uh, very explicit, like what happens in the first quadrant, the students are not going to learn that much because it's like hand holding, right? You are saying, oh, you said this, but you should have said this. Remember, this is what we say, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of feedback is not really useful, right? What if you don't provide, you provide a rationale, but you are not very explicit. You can use jitters, you can, you can, uh, um, give students uh, cues uh, and get them to uh, self-correct. Well, that would also vary because that would be like carrying the student, right? However, if you are very explicit, but you don't provide a rationale, you're very explicit about what the student has done wrong, but you don't provide a rationale, you elicit it from the student. That would be like bridging, right? And of course, the worst kind of feedback you can give is one where you are not explicit and you don't provide a rationale. Like things like good work or keep trying or be minus. According to and Mahmoud, these would be like base jumping and we all know the dangers of that sport and where those students end. So, one feedback that is in the bridging quadrants that is uh, explicit enough but does not dwell too much on a rationale, right? And I have created this um, kind of format for giving feedback out of my own personal need to be able to be constructive and be systematic and fair with my students. So I needed to be able to address every single student and provide every single student with the same quality feedback. So I came up with this idea of show that you care, and my feedback is organized into four different areas. The first thing I do, whether in writing or orally, is if I have any questions about the student's work, I will pose those questions, right? 
I will try to understand exactly what it is that the students did in order to be able to provide a fair answer. The next step will be appreciating. And by appreciating, I just go all positive. And yeah, I know what you're going to be saying. Of course, you're dealing with the affective. Or if you look at the triune brain, and you're going for the fight, you're trying to avoid the fight or flight. But no, it's good. I mean, when students, uh, and when we all receive feedback, it's very hard for us to, to hear the positive and to actually go through the positive. We immediately go into the negative, right? So the second step is show what the student has done well, reinforce that and show with the criteria where there are correspondences between students' work and the expected performance. Then engage students in reflection, right? Uh, stating the potential problems, found the challenges that you found in, the, in, the, in their own performance, and again, correlate them to evidence. And last, empower, means to give useful pieces of advice of what the student can do immediately to improve their performance. As you can see from the image that I am sharing with you now, this is mostly geared towards classroom observation and classroom and feedback on teaching, but the same framework can be adapted to um, a regular uh, classes. So what I tried to do today was to show you ways in which assessment can be embedded in teaching, can help students who are uh, learning through competencies improve their performance and not just improve but also inform about approaches to better learning right and I want to leave you with this Hankins and Hamid quote because many times we teachers are faced with new things and we think okay my god what is it now what are we going to have to do now particularly in this time and day where we are being overskirted. Uh, this idea that Hankins or Hamill have that when we had to accept a new way of doing things, does not imply throwing everything we, we have been doing away and starting afresh, but looking for ways to combine things. We've always assessed uh, maybe not in very explicit ways. I'm sure that we have all have had uh, rubrics which we have not shared with students. I'm sure we have had uh, information about this learning that we have uh, deemed uh, intuitively. But now with this idea that I'm sharing with you of embedding assessment for learning into teaching, I hope that you will be able to incorporate these things to your teaching and improve. So uh, these are my references and I'm going to stop sharing screen and be able to look at some questions that you all might have. So I'm going to open the chat. Thank you, Gabriel. This was fantastic. Can you hear me? I cannot hear you, Roshi. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can hear me, or oh, see me at least. So, can you see the questions coming down? Can everybody else hear me? Gabriel? No questions? Um, in the chat box. Chat box. Okay, questions in the chat box. Yes. Let's Can you see the chat, chat box at the bottom? Yes. Can you see Kat's question, Roshi? Kat's question. Can you give an example of, of a bridging feedback? Good question, Kat. Gabriel, can you hear me now? Ways of all 
an assessment. Um, if you refer to how you can do these activities online, well, it's very easy in that sense. Uh, actually, um, if I don't know if you have access to any learning management system, there are some which are uh, open source. Um, one I can think of off the top of my head is Edmodo. Another one I can think of the top of my head of the top of my head is Schoology. You can create your own classes there, and it has a function that even allows you to create your own rubrics and have them there for the students to see. You can also invite the students through an activity in a forum, perhaps, uh, or maybe a Zoom conference like the one we are having, and you can be online for 40 minutes for free. Uh, you can discuss the criteria, show videos uh, that you can get from YouTube uh, about participants doing something similar to what you want students to do. Okay. Thank you. And we have a question from Virginia. I don't know where your question's from, but uh, here we go. Um, Virginia Friedman says that she has trouble with hand holding in a math class. She's mm -hmm. trying to help teach um, with Spanish speaking students. It's a question of empowerment, of course, but one student wants me to continually go through all the steps with them one by one. Can you give us examples of empowerment? Actually, this oh, yeah. I have my, that's my favorite one. Yeah. I use something called three before me. Sorry, can you say that again? It's called three before me. Three before me. Yeah, three before me. So uh, you, we tend to have some students who require a lot of attention from us, mm -hmm. and they are a challenge when you have big classes, for example, and where you're trying to focus on that. So one of the class management tools that I use is this three before me. Basically, when a student approaches me, I show them my fingers with the number three, three fingers up. That means, first of all, they have to look in their notebook or their notes and make sure that if the question that they're trying to ask me has not already been answered and they have it in their materials. The second one is not in the notebook. Okay, think of the second one. Look at your materials, the course book, the handout. And if it doesn't appear there either, ask a classmate. Now, if, me, if you cannot find it in your notes, you cannot find it in the book, you cannot find it through a classmate, then you are able to come and talk to me and ask me the question. If students are working in groups, I always have a question monitor as one of the roles that I give in the group, and only that person can come and talk to me and convey the questions from the group. Hope that this helps, Virginia. Thank you. So I'm sure it's definitely very helpful for me. Um, she says, yes, very much. And we have another question from Abdullah al Khatani. I'm wondering about the online assessment for reading and writing. Do you have any ideas about that? Well, it, I, it depends on what he means by assessment, because yeah. again, if you're looking at the way that reading is traditionally assessed is through true or false, multiple choice, etc. Again, there are loads of online free tools to create multiple choice questions, true or false, and you don't have to correct them. And what you are looking for is more of a more meaningful um, archeological dig of the text, if you may, uh, then I would recommend posing um, open-ended questions or questions whose answer is not readily available from the text but where students need to risk an interpretation, et cetera. In the case of writing, again, many times I'm literally surprised that still today, writing is being tested as uh, identifying wrong things in a sentence through multiple choice. Mm. Uh, writing is expressing. Writing is creating uh, a message through a text. And the way that writing can be best uh, assessed is through, um, I mean, the students do a real life task, uh, have them, give them an, a purposeful writing task 
that they would need to do in real life, establish a clear audience for the learners, provide them with a rubric about what you're going to assess in their writing, which is not only the mechanics and the grammar and the syntax and the vocabulary, but also the author's voice, the way the message is conveyed, etc. And again, I refer you to the six plus one trait uh, rubrics for teaching writing that are available online. <clears throat> and basically that's it. That's wonderful. And I um, have a question here from yes. 10. How useful do you think building up the rubric with the students is? Yeah. Um, to me, I would say it depends on the group that you have. But on average, I would say to me it would be a 10 because I'm capitalizing not just on the on the students' awareness about what they will be able to do, but also providing them a useful metacognitive tool that they can resort to over and over again. And more importantly, we are creating a habit of mind here where the student sees themselves themselves as co-responsible for learning. They are not just at the passive end, they are active co-participants. So um, one question from Elka, if yes. meaning making is the key, where do you stand on plural languaging or translanguaging? Ah, good question, Elka, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know me, you know me. <clears throat> I'm not an expert on this. I haven't um, researched it properly, but I'm a translanguager by nature, as uh, so I have been by bilingual most of my life and sometimes there are meanings you cannot express to me insofar as the students are conveying meaning translanguage is fine and it's a, it's a golden opportunity for me actually to have the students learn something when i think back to my own experience as a language learner uh, many times when i use uh, code switching or translanguaging strategies was when uh, the learning stuck to me the most. Yes, I find this similar. Similar. I re it resonates with me. Thank you for that question, Elka. Um, any other questions? Let's see here. Um, I think Virginia is asking, can you repeat the name of the person again? Jean Harvey or Gina Harvey? Uh, when did I mention somebody? Because the name does not ring a bell. Okay. So we'll go Virginia, back if you, could, if you could tell me. Uh, I don't know myself. I can't. I remember mention, but we'll go. We'll get back to that. But get back to you, Virginia, on that. Um, let me go through the slides. Um, also, um, there will be a recording sent out, yeah. and um, definitely we'll be sharing that. And there's, um, so if there's any other questions, you can definitely send them along to us. Gabriel, thank you so very much, and we're almost no, out of time. No, please, time. my How pleasure, <laughs> my pleasure. Always learned so uh, much from you. It's just a pleasure to have you, and I'm glad to just say, you know, thank you to the New School for hosting this in this time of the pandemic. We're all uh, doing it from our homes, and you know, everyone be safe. And also, this is part of the New York State. TESOL uh, sponsored organization, and of course, IATEFL, and of course, as we know, Gabriel, congratulations on as uh, being the incoming president of IATEFL. Hey, thank you very much. It's a lot of work, but fun. <laughs> well, we'll no, you thank you guys for, for convening yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, I hope that it lives up to your expectations, and I look forward to comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Signing off.